You know what we're not talking about enough? Clouds. In chapter 1123, we finally found out the details that went into Vegapunk's plan to make his own imminent death a meaningful one. And in this flashback, Vegapunk also pointed out that there is one more thing they have to do. And that was to make sure that they don't lose the cloud plant, which Vegapunk emphasizes is important for humanity's survival. And this simple piece of dialogue has gotten me really invested into clouds and this cloud plant because I'm sure they're gonna play a much larger role in the story going forward. So we're gonna discuss all of this, but before we do, make sure to subscribe. It is September, and according to YouTube rules, you have to subscribe. Hey, I don't make the rules. In all seriousness, the faster we get this channel to 100k subscribers, the faster I stop pleading for your subscription. Okay, so back to clouds. So Edison was last seen inside the plant, extending the clouds so that the straw hats could use it to escape Egghead Island. And in this way, we could actually take it that the cloud plant has already achieved its very purpose because it's helped the straw hats escape, thereby continuing their path to eventually save the world because they are our protagonists, meaning that the cloud plant has already in an indirect way saved humanity or done its part in the saving of humanity, the saving which will happen a little bit later. But it also seems that this cloud plant is still way more important for the future of the world world survival as a whole. So firstly, why is this cloud plant important? Well, for one, it seems like you could build an entire civilization or at least its infrastructure from this one cloud plant alone. So we know that this cloud plant produces both island and sea clouds, both of which are very important and slightly distinct type of clouds very, very useful because they're not just ordinary clouds that you and I have in our ordinary world, simply made up of water vapor. Back in Skypea, Pagaya explained the differences between the island and the sea clouds and how both of them are formed or how they're created. In both cases, it starts with this mineral called pyroblin or pyrobloin? Pyroblin. Essentially, it's a molecular substance that is also found in sea stones. And when this pyroblin is mixed with water, vapor, then it creates island clouds or sea clouds. And the density of the water vapor that this pyroblin formed with, that's what determines whether that cloud will become an island cloud or a sea cloud. And we've seen in the Skypea arc how useful these clouds can be. Both island clouds and sea clouds can be cut and shaped and turned into artificial cloud products. The Milky Roads is an example of some further processed form of island clouds. And then in the Egghead arc, we've also seen these clouds being used as wheels for the Vegapunk 08, meaning that these clouds can be used for transportation, construction, which we can all agree that this sort of infrastructure is very important to building a civilization. It's important for humanity. But now we have an even greater reason to believe in its utility. Now that we know that the world is sinking, these clouds should come in very handy. I recently discussed Tequila Wolf in another video, and there I discussed how I thought the Celestial Dragon ordered the building of the Tequila Wolf Bridge and that was to prepare for another rise in water levels because they know that the war isn't over, that the ancient weapons will come into use again sometime. And now with Vegapunk emphasizing in chapter 1123 that the cloud plant in Egghead Island is crucial for humanity's survival, I now think that this dialogue also points to a similar scenario where islands or an island may be submerged into water but it's simply civilians may be able to escape migrating to these island or sea clouds to survive. Because these island and sea clouds, they're dense enough for people to live on, dense and strong enough to carry people and buildings and all kinds of things. And now if people were to live on island clouds, this should also make them a difficult target for eradication and they would likely avoid what happened to Lulucia. Because if they're up on cloud plants, that would mean that they're at a closer distance to whatever ancient weapon was used to fire at Lulucia. And if they're in such close proximity, the Gorosei or Imu would risk, potentially risk damaging its own ancient weapon if it was firing at something so close. Anyways, having this small detail in chapter 1123 just also helps us recontextualize a lot of other things we thought we already knew. Now we weren't told how Vegapunk planned to save the cloud plant, but the answer should probably be soon revealed by Lilith. In fact, she might even have the 
the cloud plant with her right now. Which sounds crazy because we've now seen her leave Egghead with the straw hats, not carrying anything with her, let alone something as large as the cloud plant. But considering this is Vegapunk we're talking about, it's not completely illogical to think it's possible that she might have the cloud plant on her person. Vegapunk has been able to modify an entire island from its original state, making everything around him far more advanced than any other island we've seen to date, controlling the weather or the temperature and the environment through an island-wide air conditioning system, for example. Which is actually also very important to this whole topic of clouds, because in order for island and sea clouds to maintain its form, they need a very particular temperature. They usually can't survive in the blue sea because of the environment, but Vegapunk developed an island-wide air condition system, one that's able to regulate Egghead's climate so that it can replicate the environment that's found up above, like in Skypiea. We've also seen that Egghead is an island where people are able to interact with holograms by using special gloves. There's a machine, a cooking machine, that's able to make up up to 500 different types of meals. So with all of this in mind, it's not really all that hard to believe that Vegapunk might have invented a device where you can change the mass and density of an object, you know, think of pin particles from Marvel's Ant-Man. So maybe when Atlas knocked Lilith out, she also planted, huh, I wasn't actually going for a cloud plant pun there, but maybe she planted a condensed form of the cloud plant on Lilith at the same time. Now I am just spitballing here, the answer could be a lot more tame. Maybe Lilith just has the blueprint of the cloud plant with her, and maybe she just has like a piece of the cloud plant, you know, a very important, crucial piece that's going to help her rebuild this plant. Because the last time we actually saw this plant was in chapter 1121 and the area surrounding it was being burnt and it seemed like the fires were getting closer. And so it seems like this cloud plant will actually be eventually engulfed by these flames. So we don't actually know whether it did get saved. And actually that means Atlas wouldn't have been able to leave it with Lilith because that happened earlier and Lilith wouldn't actually have the cloud plant with her at this stage because they were already leaving by this point. Unless she has a copy of the cloud plant, I'm sure that is still in the realm of possibility for a genius scientist even if it seems less likely. Otherwise then I guess that raises the question of whether Oda choosing to highlight the importance of the cloud plant as being able to save humanity is in fact what I was saying earlier because it's already played its part in helping the Straw Hats to escape. I don't know because seriously I think I think with the water levels rising this cloud plant will have an even greater significance into the future. Anyways chapter 1123 got me looking into clouds into greater detail because of Vegapunk's dialogue and it's allowed me to make connections that I hadn't before. An important one relates to how Vegapunk came up with this invention in the first place. So I explained earlier how sea and island clouds are formed about the mixing of the pyroblin with the water vapor but to get even more specific, we were told that the Pyroblin get shot up higher into the sky via volcanic eruptions. And I had actually previously forgotten this detail. Whereas now, I'm wondering whether this means that Vegapunk created the cloud plant after the events of that great battle between Sakazuki and Kuzan at Punk Hazard. Because Punk Hazard is a location, or Punk Hazard in the present, is a location that would surely provide an ample supply of these two components that are required to create island and sea clouds. So as we saw in another part of Vegapunk's flashback, Punk Hazard once possessed the characteristics of a tropical island. But we know that after Sakazuki and Kuzan's death match, the island was divided into fire and ice. And like I just explained, Pagaya explained that volcanic eruptions is what causes pure blend particles to shoot up into the high sky, but because he's quite vague about it, we don't know all that much about the pyroblin keratin. And so it's possible that this mineral is actually something that's not only shot up from volcanic eruptions, but it's a mineral that is part of perhaps the magma, which is a liquid or the substance that is underneath the Earth's crust, the liquid that erupts when a volcano erupts. And obviously, the fight between Sakazuki and Kuzan would have involved a lot of magma given Sakazuki's devil fruit, whereas Kuzan's 
Japan's powers being ice related. That's also very relevant because against fire and magma, the heat, that ice would have melted, thereby producing water vapors. And look, I'm no great scientist, it's not one of my strong suits, but I'm sure you know where I'm getting at. We've got the perfect ingredients to produce island and sea clouds. Pyroblin from the magma and water vapor from the ice. Robin also explained that the tension between ice and fire at Punk Hazard was causing these strong wind gusts. And I wonder whether this unique climate and this wind activity, this may have also allowed for the perfect temperature for these special island and sea clouds to form. Or at least Vegapunk was able to be inspired and was able to research more about the island and sea clouds by having so many of these resources available at Punk Hazard. Especially because we know that Vegapunk has created some of his most well-known inventions by inspiration from other prominent figures for example, we know that Kuma was the model for the pacifistas, Kizaru's laser ability that was the weapon for the pacifistas, and the Seraphims were also created out of the Warlords and King's Lunarian DNA, you know, mixed in with some of the other characters' Devil Fruit abilities. Which is why now my headcanon is that this cloud plant was created after studying the interaction between Sakazuki and Kuzan's Devil Fruits. And I obviously know that Vegapunk had already left Punk Hazard by this stage, but we know that he's able to transport things using sea beast weapons because he speculates that York was able to use the sea beast to transform a sample of the mother flame to the Gorosei, which is how they were able to fuel the ancient weapon to eradicate Lulucia. And that's an important piece of information in general. But now I'm going to use this information to also further support my hypothesis, which is that Vegapunk may have used these sea beast weapons to transport, you know, materials, the resources from Punk has to support his own research, and that was how he came up with this cloud plant. And I know that's just my head canon, but can you just imagine how poetic it would be if it was revealed that the reason how Vegapunk was able to achieve and create perhaps his best invention, the invention that's going to lead to humanity's survival, that was actually because of Sakazuki and Kuzan, a current fleet admiral, the former admiral and a current pirate. Anyways, that's my long-winded way of saying that clouds are going to be important to the story of One Piece going forward. And this cloud plant must have been emphasized in chapter 1123, for a specific reason. And don't even get me started on the Imperial Cumulus, which in itself is another hugely mystical cloud formation that we need to discuss in its own right. And if you remember, it's the Imperial Cumulus that is hypothesized, suggested in the series to have created the effect of those three large shadows, the giant shadows that we saw at the end of the Skypiea arc. But that's another mystery in and of itself. If you have any ideas on that or if you'd like to discuss it together, let me know. But like I said, this panel and this dialogue about clouds or about the cloud plant in particular, that was just one minor detail, but I thought it sparked so many ideas within me that I thought were necessary or helpful to discuss. But this panel and dialogue about the clouds, or about the cloud plant in particular, that was actually just one minor detail amidst many important panels in recent chapters that I think we have to discuss because as we go further into the final saga, I swear that Oda is jam-packing every chapter in with so much hidden detail that's going to be important for the future of the series. This Vegapunk flashback, which took up the majority of chapter 1123, that made everything clearer in retrospect. I can't wait to go back and reread Egghead Island because I can't wait to see what sort of new details will pop out at me now that I know Vegapunk's contingency plan. In general, I really liked how they framed the destruction of Egghead and the death of of Vegapunk as a victory for Vegapunk. I think there are some things that could be said to question some of the choices that Vegapunk has made. Or namely, I can't help but question whether the smartest man in the world really couldn't come up with another solution, some way to survive. And I think that's a topic that could be unpacked to greater depth. But given he was presented with a lot of death flags since early on in the arc, I think this was a very nice way to round off his character. And I like the chapter presented this essence of victory here. The smartest man in the world fittingly orchestrated what would happen even after his death. Whereas for chapter 1124, 
Despite being quite a short chapter, there are a lot of important panels, a lot of small details that seem to not contribute all that much to the story, but then upon closer look, seem to have much deeper meaning. The chapter itself, despite it ending on a very hype note, at a few key moments, this chapter is quite melancholic. Something that really caused my heart to pang was Sentamaro now being alone, or I guess I should say that he is alone again. And he now also has to be a fugitive from the world government, even though he was only acting on the orders of Vegapunk, who really just guilt-tripped Sentomaru into helping him. Although I don't think Sentomaru really minded, we did see that he's actually very loyal to Vegapunk, whom he considers his savior. But it's just this whole broken friendship between Sentomaru, Vegapunk, and Kizaru that's just also very tragic. And I have actually discussed Kizaru's part in all of this in greater detail, so check out that video. But as for Sentomaru, I actually think he's a potential future ally because Lilith has survived. But to no surprise, my favorite part of this chapter involves the Straw Hats. I really like the way that the crew has been split up into different groups. I think it says a lot about their respective characters. The manliest of the men are riding the Sunny, while Luffy and the rest of them are waiting for Lilith to wake up, except for Robun who's not seen with the crew and, and she's not actually seen until the feast where we've got the great toast with the giants. So I think it makes sense for Zoro, Frankie and Jinbei to be on the sunny. Jinbei, the helmsman, is needed to steer the ship. Frankie needs no explanation as to why he's on the sunny. Whereas for Zoro, he's the least chummy of the Straw Hats. He's also on the ship instead of waiting for Lilith to wake up like the others. These may seem like small details, but I tend to appreciate the more relaxed environment more than others. It adds food to the imagination when you try to picture what might have happened off screen. And it showcases just how much Oda knows his characters through these simple panels. It's one of those little off-key moments that further adds to the nuance of One Piece. For example, like I said, Robin has been pretty absent in previous chapters, even when we see the other Straw Hats. So I would imagine that Robin has been off screen talking to giants since she would likely have a lot of questions questions about what they know about Ohara, or to listen to stories surrounding Saul, and this is in fact the first thing that she mentions to Chopper, her excitement at being able to reunite with Saul. Or another important panel in all of this is Zoro's dialogue, and one in particular. So there's actually been quite a bit of talk about this online, and I'm very surprised that it hasn't actually been the center of its own video, because... Okay, what do we think about Zoro's line here? Leave a comment of your thoughts about when he says that Luffy is pathetic. As for my thoughts, well, I'm not gonna lie, it felt a little odd or almost out of place, definitely unexpected. It's an iffy area to navigate. On one hand, I sort of understand why Zoro would react this way. I mean, do I support or agree with his reaction? Not necessarily. But I do think we can make a sense of why he said what he did in the context of Zoro's character. We've seen Zoro play this role of the stern vice captain in the past. We saw it at Punk Hazard and even before that at Water 7. Zoro is often strict with Luffy and he has to remind him of his role as captain. At the end of the day, Zoro has been willing to subordinate himself under Luffy. And this has been in the belief of Luffy and in his dream. And Zoro has said that he will only follow strength. But I have to say that this dialogue, it still felt a little harsher than usual. But I think that may be just a testament to just how high the stakes are now. And the others recognized it too. We were up against an admiral. We were up against all five of the Elder Stars, not to mention the whole marine armada that were present. And so now that we're in the final saga, I think this is Zoro's way of saying, wake up. If you think that we're not gonna face any deaths, you are mistaken. You know, that's what it means to be at this level of playing field. And at the same time, I think it makes sense that he may be a little bit more desensitized than the others. If you look back on the Egghead Island arc, he's the straw hat that spent the least amount of time with the Vegapunks. He's had really no time to bond with them like the others. And also, and this may be just me reading into it a little bit too much, but my headcanon is that Zoro may be deflecting 
deflecting a little bit. I think Zoro may be somewhat blaming himself for what happened for the outcome of the Egghead Island arc. I mean, sure, it was a victory, especially now that Lilith has confirmed that all the Vega punks live on within her. But until that was clarified, for all intents and purposes, the Straw Hats were not able to fulfill their promise to help Vegapunk escape. And even if he doesn't necessarily blame himself, I think Zoro is still harder on himself than anyone else. And I think that he might think that his actions and his decisions contributed to their perceived failure. Because at the start of the arc, Zoro chose to stay on the ship. Perhaps he thinks, you know, if I wasn't on the ship or if I wasn't at least napping, I would have been able to dispatch of Kaku earlier. Or if he wasn't on the ship at all, seeing as Dusty would have taken care of Kaku anyways, Zoro could have helped the fight against the Seraphim, or he might have become involved in that fight a lot earlier. Or perhaps he thinks that he should have taken care of Luchi a lot faster, because actually it took Sanji calling Zoro a deadweight in order for Zoro to beat Luchi. And actually, maybe I might be just being too harsh now. But we also have to consider the fact that Kizaru obliterated the Straw Hats back at Saobodi. And Zoro didn't even get a chance to fight Kizaru in this arc. He didn't get a chance to test his current ability against that of the Admiral. And Zoro loves to fight. We know that about his character. You know, it's what he and Luffy bond over the most. Luffy and Sanji might be able to bond over food or might be able to bond over their seemingly impossible dreams. Usopp and Chopper are the ones that Luffy does all of the childish things with. But when it comes to Luffy and Zoro, they bond over their strength. Zoro follows Luffy because of his strength. And so at the least, I think this might have at least upset Zoro. But I'm glad to see that by the end of the chapter, we got the classic straw hat feast. It really wouldn't have felt like the end of an arc without it. Wouldn't have felt like a victory without it. But as for some other details that I think are worth mentioning in chapter 1124, this is Bonnie and Kuma's first travels together on a ship and you can just see how happy Bonnie is in having her dad with her. Which is obvious because they've been separated for so long, but I think we can read into it further. You know, from Kuma's flashback, we saw that it was always been Bonnie's dream in order to be able to travel with her dad. And so in that sense, this is their first travel adventure together, and I think that makes this scene even more heartwarming. And seeing as we have been reading way into panels today, I think it's quite funny that Nami beat up Luffy on the way to Egghead, but now as they're leaving, she's ended up caring for him. And you know, she's the one that he's lying on, all beaten up and tired. Anyways, these were just some small details that I think have greater significance than we may have realized, some greater meaning that we can look into. Let me know what you think by leaving your thoughts below. If you enjoyed today's discussion, make sure to like and share the video. And please do subscribe because it is September. Thank you to everyone who is subscribed already. And thank you to these lovely people. I don't know what side of the screen it's going to be on. Thank you for supporting the channel by being a Patreon or channel member. You too can become a Patreon or channel member. But your continued viewership and your subscription is more than enough. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.